morning, everyone. I'm Aparna, and on behalf of the Sarmaya Arts Foundation, I welcome you to Sarmaya Talks at the Asiatic Society. Sarmaya Arts Foundation is, not a, is a not-for-profit organization that has a curated repository of art, artifacts, and living traditions from the Indian subcontinent. It was founded in 2015 by Mr. Paul Abraham, a Mumbai-based banker, history enthusiast, and arts patron. Sarmaya's mission is to make India's art, heritage, and culture more accessible and inspire young learners to discover their cultural inheritance through a critical and compassionate lens. We work on a hybrid programming model, serving audiences both online and on the ground. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Rakshanda Jali, a multi-award winning translator, writer, and literary historian. She has published over 25 books and written over 50 academic papers and essays. Some of her books include Liking Progress, Loving Change, a literary history of the progressive writer's movement in Urdu, a translation of The Sea Lies Ahead, Intizar Hussain's seminal novel on Karachi. She runs an organization called Hindustani Awaz, devoted to the popularization of Hindi, Urdu literature and culture. She's the editor of the Taj magazine. Dr. Jalil, the stage is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Very grateful to Sarmaya Talks for inviting me here. My first visit to uh, this grand building. I would have loved to have seen some more of it, but maybe on another occasion. It's a great pleasure to be here. I will be talking about the First World War, Jange Azim, as it is called in Urdu. Um, my work has been increasingly on accessing Urdu literature and looking for its representation um, uh, through translations. So um, um, while the book that I will be talking about, which is this, The Great War, Indian Responses to the First World War, has, a refer has translations from Bangla, from Hindi, from Urdu, also from English. But every now and then I'll stud my narrative with instances of Urdu poetry and how the Urdu poet is looking at the world around him. Coming to the topic uh, of the war, as you know, the war rages between uh, 28 July 1914 and 11 November 1918. And these four years see the service of 1.3 million Indians, out of whom 74,000 never returned. This is a war that is not fully understood by many of the participants. Um, and which is why, as I will explain in the course of my talk, why um, the, the representation of this war in literature is slender. I'm not saying it's absent, it is there, which explains a work such as mine and others. Uh, but uh, it is slender and also there is a sort of ambiguity. We will come to the reasons of that ambiguity too. But before I come to the war, I want to flag certain things for you because I want to place the events of starting from 1914 and how the world hurtles towards 1918. I want to place certain, certain events both on the national arena and the international arena to give you a political context of the war. There is, uh, to my mind, one very momentous event which is often overlooked uh, even by commentators on in Indian history, and this is the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. The two Balkan Wars, uh, 1912 and 1913, and then, of course, the later events post, uh, uh, post the, the First World War, such as Gandhi's first call to civil disobedience, such as the Khilafat movement, and so on. Now, about the Japanese victory, I want to read out a very short extract from Jawaharlal Nehru's autobiography to indicate why this arouses so much hope within Asians, within Indians, that if it is possible in Japan, then why is it not possible in the rest of Asia? So about the Japanese victory over Russia, this is what Nehru is writing in his autobiography. Japanese victories stirred up my enthusiasm, and I waited eagerly for papers with fresh news daily. 
nationalistic ideas filled my mind. I mused of Indian freedom and Asiatic freedom from the thraldom of Europe. Also remember, in the years just before the, the war, um, there is the triumvirate of, the, of as it's called, Bal, Pal, Lal. Uh, we know about Bal Gangadhar Tilak and his call for home rule. Um, there is also the inspiration from the Irish uh, revolutionaries who are talking about home league, about home rule. All of these things are being picked up in different ways, whether it is Annie Basant, whether it is a poet, Urdu poet such as uh, Hasrat Mohani, whether the, the inspiration that people like Bal Gangadhar Tilak are giving to others. This is also a time when by and large, the Congress, the Indian National Congress, which is at this point the la single largest political party in India, is at the same time, uh, the, the bulk of the people in the INC are those who are cautious about Purna Swaraj, while it is being raised in various Congress sessions, but the great uh, majority of, of those within the Congress even till Gandhi's return uh, to India, are cautiously talking about experiments in self-governance. There are two other instances I want to flag uh, for you uh, in, as I'm trying to lay out the, the political backdrop of what is happening. One of them is the very draconian Press Act of 1913. Now the way it works is with all Bhasha literatures producing large numbers of newspapers in the vernacular newspapers, um, the way to gag many of these because their editors or their contributors are writing things that are considered subversive or of a revolutionary kind. So the way the Press Act of India uh, works is that you forfeit the security deposits of the owner or the editor. And in that way, you just force them into closure. And in Urdu, because as I said, my frame of reference increasingly over the past years is Urdu, uh, I have looked at uh, the, the fate that is uh, 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 meted out to uh, Maulana Azad's Al-Hilal, to uh, Muhammad Ali Johar's comrade, uh, to Hasrat Mahani's Kilai Mawla, and so on. So gagged and bound, the voices that are beginning to call out for freedom are methodically first identified, and then the agitators are silenced. Uh, in some instances, the owners of these newspapers are just put in prison. In other instances, because their security deposits are forfeited, they are effectively gagged, and you know they lose business. And, and uh, so while on the one hand you have this systematic silencing of voices, on the other hand, just as war, uh, the news of the war breaks out, the Indian government, uh, the British government in India, is, goes all out to expect and demand help from the Indian subjects. So there is this duality with the benefit of hindsight we are able to see very sharply. And the, the intention is to extract the maximum possible help. It is still being called help, but the great part of it is forced help. The other thing I want to flag for you, just as I, before I come to the First World War, is the Balkan Wars, which I said of 1912 and 1913. In Urdu poetry in particular, we find vast amounts of poetry on these Balkan Wars. I just want to flag two instances from the many that I had studied. One is um, uh, Sir Muhammad Iqbal, who is very active during this time. This is his most active, most politically sharp period of his writings. And uh, you might have heard of his long poem called the Shikwa, meaning complaint. And then in later years, he writes jawab e shikwa which is the answer to the complaint. In jawab e shikwa uh, Iqbal is writing. I'm, I'm reading translations here only. The trouble that is raging in the Balkans is a message of awakening to the forgetful. Thou mayest think it the means of vexing thy heart, but in reality it is a test of thy self-sacrifice and self-reliance. Why art thou frightened at the neighing of the enemy's horse? Truth's light can never be put out by the breath of the enemy. Now all this is rhetoric, but couched in that rhetoric rhetoric is a sharp political message. 
in the instance of Shibli Nomani, another major poet of that time, who's writing Hangama e Balkan, that message comes out even more sharply. He says, when decline has set in over political power, the name and banner will stand how long? In the Ur Urdu original, the refrain is kap tak, and it's a very dramatic poem. The smoke from the burnt candle of a vanished assembly will rise how long? When the sky has torn the mantle of power to pieces, its shreds will float in the air how long? Gone is Morocco, gone is Persia. We have now to see this, self, this helpless, sick man of Turkey will live how long? Now, Turkey uh, and the Caliphate, by extension, have a profound influence on the Indian Muslims because the, the Khalifa, the Caliph, is seen, uh, rightly or wrongly, as a kind of a... Uh, as a, as a kind of a spokesperson for many in the Islamic world. The tide of woe which is advancing from the Balkans, the size of the oppressed will stem how long? So a poet such as Shibli Nomani, long before the uh, outbreak of the First World War, is drawing the Indian people's attention to the trouble that is brewing in the Balkans in a, a large parts of Europe, but will affect them in some way or the other. Shortly thereafter, when war breaks out, the first news we get from it is actually from an announcement by the Viceroy of India, Lord Harding. And uh, this is announced without any consultation with Indian leaders, and it says, we are at war. Um, now, this announcement is met with a fair amount of uh, very enthusiastic uh, reception from princely India. The rajas and princes of the various princely states bend over backwards to offer help, both money and material help. The Indian political elite, too, offer, and the educated middle classes, too, offer support uh, uh, to the war. Um, the great many who enlist in the war, first voluntarily and then later through forced enlistments, do so, I suspect, without any clear understanding of the war, of the political terms of this engagement, of who is at war with whom, and um, also uh, why they are part of this war. It must also be said that in the early days of the war, the war doesn't impinge the political consciousness of the ordinary people in very direct ways. There are some food shortages, yes. Uh, because of rationing, there are the occasional uh, skirmish or riot over food shortages. As the war rages, events in India are also hurtling along. And by the time the war is en ending, the cries for home rule, for Swaraj, are also gaining uh, political momentum. So along with the war, there are things happening within India in the course of those four years. Now, um, I also want to draw your attention as we come to the beginning of the war. Remember that the Asian, uh, the Asian presence, and in particular the Indian presence in Europe, has been limited. Um, by all accounts, there are 40,000 to 50,000 Asians in the British Army, in especially the Navy, uh, stationed in different ports. We have the most famous example of uh, Victorian Abdul, the cook that uh, is cook and Man Friday. Uh, in uh, Queen Victoria's court. We have increasingly a stream of well-to-do Indians, most notable examples being uh, Gandhiji himself, Pandit Nehru, and others, mostly from well-to-do families who come to the UK to take the bar at law exam to become barristers. Very few stay back, more, more, the great majority of them go back. But this is a nominal presence. This is not a large presence of Indians in Europe. Now with the outbreak of war, a new kind of Indian is coming, is crossing the Suez, taking the ships, coming to Europe. Now, 
with the war while the uh, there is a handful of educated indians they could be vets they could be uh, medical officers in the uh, british army they could be um, um, uh, you know there are no officers they they could be those who are that's very small number of officers and the ranks are limited i'll give you the instance of one from hyderabad as i as i go along in this talk and the few who are educated are mostly from the cities such as pune uh, bombay uh, hyderabad and so on the great majority are people uh, who have been enlisted the majority are peasants um, many from landlocked areas in the punjab in the northwestern frontier provinces in uttar pradesh also as you would possibly know the british have this theory of martial races they think that certain races certain castes are more warlike than others and so enlistments are concentrated from the gurkhas uh, from people in nepal from the sikhs from the punjabi muslims in fact there are several <coughs> uh, uh, several platoons of punjabi muslims within the british army and remember also that before the the first world war men from the punjab have been enlisted f- to fight uh, various wars the the anglo afghan wars there is the, uh, the the boxer revolution in china the skirmishes in cairo have all always seen large numbers of men from uh, punjab who have been part of the british army and who have seen action and shown enormous valor so the accounts that we have and the accounts that i talk about in this book are all the great majority are from people who are not educated or they are literate at best but not always uh, 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 very educated i will, would like to read some samplings of letters that the soldiers wrote if you are interested many of these letters are ava- available on an online archive of the india office records i was able to access them sitting in my home in delhi uh, while some are in the archives of the british library in london a great many of them are in public archives and anybody can ar- access them online uh, remember that the british uh, had this great policy of censorship and early on in the war the first thing that was set up was a censor office the idea was to not just gauge the morale of the soldiers but also to find out what information was being given out early on in the uh, war they uh, intercepted some letters that were revolutionary and therefore uh, subversive and so the idea of the censor office uh, in bulon was uh, was uh, under a certain captain eb hall whose job was to censor every outbound letter and every inbound letter and thank god for that because while the letters have not s- survived the ravages of time these censored extracts have and they give us a marvelous insight not just into the psychology of these men what they were going through but a very subaltern view of history uh, in many instances these views are corroborated by the accounts that are given to us by professional historians they are corroborated oddly enough by uh, creative writers some of those examples i will give you let me just read out some of these uh, these letters we have some very simplistic uh, responses such as this one written out from a hospital remember that from early 1915 onwards large amounts of sh- uh, wounded uh, soldiers began to be shipped to uh, to to uh, uk and first in brighton then in southampton a hospital was set up just specifically for wounded soldiers from uh, indian wounded soldiers so we have one account from a york place hospital as early as 10th november 1915 and this is very flattering to the government government has made excellent arrangements for the sick and wounded there is no trouble of any kind we pass our days in joyful ease while government showers us benefits upon us we bless god continuously and pray for his bounty but all such a, but all letters are not like this and the the translations that were made in the by the censor board and those translations that are to be found in the india office records show another picture 
I have another account from 2nd December 1915 of an Indian soldier in the Kitchener's Hospital. And this says, alas, we are not free to go about at will. In fact, we Indians are treated like prisoners. On all sides, there is barbed wire and a sentry stands at the door. Leave London out of the question. We cannot even get to see New Milton properly. If I had known that such a state of affairs would exist, I would never have come. If you ask me the truth, I can say that I have never experienced such hardship in my life. True, we are well fed and are given plenty of clothing, but the essential thing, freedom, is denied to us. Convicts in India are sent to Andaman Islands, but we have found our convict station here in England. The reason behind this strict uh, ghettoization and this segregation is this whole obsession that the British had with racial purity. The idea was for the Indian soldiers, wounded though they are, not to meet the white races, and God forbid to meet white women. So this is an overriding fear, uh, and for, for which explains uh, uh, in great part this kind of uh, segregation. We have another letter written in Garwali by a son to his father. And this talks about how Indians were being put in positions of great physical danger, who were being used virtually as cannon fodder. And explains the large numbers of casualties in those trenches, in those front lines of war where Indians were being deployed in large numbers. Later, there was an alteration in this maths and Indians were pulled back, in part also because the morale was so low because of the large numbers of casualties that they were pulled out from the trenches in, 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 in France and Belgium and later deployed in West Asia. A whole lot of reasons were at play, including geography and climate, uh, that it was felt that maybe they'll be better suited to the sandy wastes of West Asia or patrolling in Mesopotamia and, or, or guarding the Suez Canal than they are in cold, wet Europe. So here is this Gadwali young man writing to his father. It is very hard to endure the bombs, father. It will be difficult for anyone to survive and come back safe and sound from the war. The son who is very lucky will see his father and mother, otherwise who can do this? There is no confidence of survival. The bullets and cannonballs come down like snow. The mud is up to a man's middle. The distance between us and the enemy is 50 paces. Since I have been here, the enemy has remained in his trenches and we in ours, neither side has advanced at all. The Germans are weak. that have fallen cannot be counted. Uh, we have other letters. We have letters, woebegone, pathos laden letters of father writing to the war office and saying that, you know, my son is for uh, him to be back home. Such the meticulousness of the war office records that fortunately. Again, with the benefit of hindsight, we are able to see both sides of the coin. We are able to see some of these letters also saved in the archives. Uh, we also have, again, uh, another subaltern view of history. For instance, and these are very interesting, they are about how clean everything is. Coming from villages in the Punjab, in Uttar Pradesh, in Bengal, and other parts of India, they are struck by how clean everything is, mm. even in the smallest of villages. So you have a letter where somebody is saying, even the butcher shops are so clean. Even the smallest shops in the villages, people take pride in cleanliness. A shopkeeper will sweep the front of his kitchen. Um, there are instances of soldiers writing back and saying how everything is so expensive. So while they get a small amount of money, even when they're wounded, they get the small amount uh, from the army, and they're supposed to spend it very cautiously. So they're saying even newspapers are very expensive. Then they give a rationale. All this I'm finding in the letters, okay? So I'm, I'm at this point still talking about letters. 
So they say that because everybody, the big and the small, everybody reads newspapers and how newspapers come every day. Back home, they're used to newspapers coming with a delay of a certain days. So uh, then also, because some of the uh, soldiers are able to understand that there is censorship, they resort to camouflage, to the use of illusions. I found this lovely letter from a Khan Mohammed in the 40th. 40th Pathans, posted in, uh, not posted, uh, recuperating in the Brighton Hospital, writing to his friend in Hong Kong who's seeing active war. He's using the metaphor of black peppers and red peppers. The black peppers are the Indian soldiers and the red peppers are the British soldiers. And because black, black peppers are a plenty and they are hard and they are uh, you know, he uses the word hard. So he's saying, please send some more black peppers because we are running short of black peppers and red peppers are not proving to be at all effective. So, and then he says, now you must understand what I have said and multiply it by 45. Meaning, I'm only giving you an indication of the way things are, multiply it by 45 to understand exactly how bad things are. Okay, now, while uh, there is a dispute about the number that we have, 1.3 million, there is absolutely no dispute in the courage and the bravery shown by the Indian soldiers uh, across Europe, in the Mediterranean, and in the Middle East. South, o South Asian soldiers win many awards for bravery. There is a total of 12,908 awards out of which there are 11 Victoria Crosses. And the first of them is given to Khudadad Khan. He's the first Indian to get the Victoria uh, Cross. And he belongs to the 129th Duke of Connaught's own uh, Baluchis. And he has shown exemplary courage. And so it is for this. But also, I think, uh, you, you would have heard of the victor victory parade that is taken out in July 1919, how uh, through the streets of London, uh, Indian soldiers march in all their finery and how they are cheered and welcomed uh, by the British public for the services and help they have rendered. Of course, it's enormous cost. Now, given this large representation of Indians, um, given the large numbers of deaths of Indian soldiers, one is perplexed by why there isn't sufficient acknowledgement of this help. In the centenary year uh, in um, 2014, some efforts were made by Indian diasporic groups in UK and support was mobilized to bring attention to the Indian presence. But I think somewhere we must also take into the fact that Indian nationalism is on the rise during this time. There is some ambivalence within Indians at this time that why is this help being rendered and at what cost? So somewhere I think the ambivalence, the ambiguity as to why we are fighting somebody else's war also accounts for this. Also, the enlistments had begun to get a bad name towards the end as the war raged. Michael Adwai, in particular in the Punjab, is responsible for the most harsh enlistment uh, measures. His deputies are given quotas that they have to fill, and Punjab is most notorious for that. Uh, today, Punjab accounts for the largest representation of men, but it is at a great cost. Not all of it is voluntary. At the district level, people are told to fill this many number in a given day, and that causes a lot of, uh, of, of heartbreak. Later, uh, if I have time, I would like to read out some of the folk songs and ditties that are written. Uh, that have been collected in this book uh, uh, by a scholar from Punjab, Amarjeet Singh, who has talked about how, from the women's point of view, the cost of, and how written in the age-old tradition of Bira poetry, poetry of separation, women talk about their men who have been taken away by, uh, by the British to go and fight the Firangis war. Now, um, as I am running long and getting, uh, I, I don't want to take too much time. How am I doing for time? Uh, somebody was supposed to let me know. Um, okay, it seemed to be fine. Okay, let me draw your attention to the first response 
uh, Lit Indian's response to the war comes very early in the war, as early as December 1914. This comes from no less than Rabindranath Tagore, and he writes in response to an editorial that has appeared in the journal Shabuj Patra, and he is drawing the Indian attention to something that later historians have picked on, which is the marriage of commerce and war. And using the Indian caste system and examples from the Kurukshetra War, Tagore is talking about European mercantile interests with the expansion of the empire in Asia and Africa. And I'm quoting from Tagore. This was written in Bangla, and in this book, it has been translated into English by Devjani Sengupta. I'm reading Devjani's uh, English translation. Business is now no longer trade and commerce. It is now married to the empire. Once the merchant had owned material things, now he owns human beings. The difference between then and now is apparent. Unlike the times when the king and country were one, the empire builders are now traders who indulge in import and export in far corners of the world. The quote closes here. Later, if I have time, I'll give you instances of how this very nuanced understanding, almost a political theory of war, is picked up and expounded by the poets. Poets who have no political theory and no large uh, understanding of the politics behind war, but who are quick to see this marriage of war and trade. I also want to draw the attention uh, to uh, an extract from a novel that I have used, a novel by Abdullah Hussain called The Weary Generations. It has a character called Naeem, and he's married to a woman called Azra. Naeem and Azra, in a way, reflect uh, the British Empire and the marriage between the British Empire and the jewel and the crown, which is India. It's an uneasy marriage that ends in estrangement. Now. Uh, Naeem, the protagonist of this novel, uh, by the way, this novel is written as late as 1963, and it is considered one of the literary masterpieces in Urdu. It was translated into English by the author himself, Abdullah Hussain, and in, uh, in Urdu literature, it's considered quite a milestone uh, of novel writing. So uh, uh, the, the, the protagonist here is representative of the kind of person who is picked up for uh, enlistment. Today, I had posted um, on Facebook uh, um, the Sarmaya poster, and somebody who's my Facebook friend, whom I've never met before, Brahma Prakash Gaur, uh, wrote a long post about his uncle, who had also taken part in the First World War. And I was struck by the similarity of the, it is there in my Facebook posts are public, you can read the story of Mr. Gaur's uncle. Uh, and I was struck by the similarities I find between the stories that have been picked up and whether it is a Mulkraj Anand talking in his novel Across the Black Waters or it is Abdullah Hussain talking about uh, Naeem's story in The Weary Generations, there is a similarity in all of these stories. These young men from dusty little villages and hamlets, uh, how they make this journey, how they are picked up for, uh, in a, a recruitment centers, how they travel by train to ports, be it Karachi or Bombay or Chennai, how they board a ship for the first time in their lives, and why, which is why Mulk Rajanan's novel is crawled across the black waters, how they make this journey. The, the sights and sounds of those Indian ports, then the journey itself in the sea, obviously not in very salubrious conditions. I'm sure they travel cattle class or worse. And then landing in these European ports, their first encounter with, with, with Europe. All of these make very interesting reading. Um, I won't go into the details, they are all there in this book. I also want to draw your attention to a short story which has been translated and used here. It is by Chandradhar Sharma Guleri. It is called Usne Kaha Tha. In 1960, a film was made, a Hindi film was made, starring Sunil Dutt and Nanda. Uh, the story is a romantic uh, story, a simple story, uh, but it is also, again, uh, it contains very valuable subaltern insights into war. It talks about how caste barriers are left behind, how uh, people eat 
uh, in the same place, coming from a society which is very caste-ridden, how caste taboos are broken during war. It talks about um, uh, valor, about courage, uh, it talks about bravery in the face of all kinds of odds. It also talks about the very wet uh, and cold trenches um, in, in, in Brussels. So uh, stories like these, um, Chandradhar Sharma's Guleri story, Usne Kaha Tha, is a valuable story for various reasons. It is considered the first Hindi short story. Uh, written in 1914 and published in 1915 in a journal called Saraswati. It is one of the earliest responses cr uh, through the creative medium to uh, the war. And I I'm very curious how and why uh, Chandradhar Sharma Guleri is able to give such a faithful, almost eyewitness account. I can only assume that this account is coming either from these letters that uh, people are writing home, which seems doubtful, considered they are censored, more likely, it is coming from uh, newspaper accounts. Because uh, such is the attention to detail, and such is the fidelity of creating that mahal, that atmosphere of those trenches, that one is struck by what are his sources. Also, um, given the large uh, presence of the princely estates uh, and the contribution of the, uh, of the princes and, and, and the rulers and the rajas, uh, one very interesting account is by Lieutenant Colonel Azmatullah Khan. And this account is different from the others that I have found in this book uh, because it comes from an elitist perspective. He is an educated person. But what is interesting is in the form of a memoir. What is interesting is that I was able to corroborate every single detail in his memoir. When he says our contingent and he gives the name, went to this place and he gives the date, traveled from this place to this place, I'm able to corroborate each one of those things with the war office records. So clearly this is a very, very faithful uh, 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 diary account. All right, then uh, let me also briefly talk about a novel written in Bangla called Bondhan Hara, meaning breaking of bonds. Um, this is by Kazi Nazrul Islam, whom we all know as a poet. But here, uh, he's the bard of Bengal, and we know him through his songs of rural Bengal. But here is a novel where he talks uh, in the first person uh, through a protagonist called Nurul, who um, is an 18-year-old lad who has left his home in Bardhaman district, traveled across the breadth of the Indian subcontinent to Karachi Harbor to board a ship which will take him to Marcel. And he's talking about a whole bunch of things. And this whole novel is, in the form, is an epistolary novel. It is written in the form of letters that this boy, 18-year-old lad, writes to his friend and to his bhabi, his uh, sister-in-law, back home in Bardhaman. And it is a luminous account of how the rain falls differently in Karachi from Bardhaman, how the sky seems different, the earth seems different. Also, I found it valuable because we never ask ourselves how do young men who are enlisted in war react to the taking of life? Society, family, our religious texts tell us it is a sin to take a human life, to not harm a fellow being. And yet war is just the opposite. War is teaching you, encouraging you to take lives. So an 18-year-old boy is talking of the horrors of war, of being plunged into the fires of Mesopotamia. And he says, I may not have time to read the extracts, but briefly he's saying that why do I have this insatiable blood lust? Why is there this rage inside me to take a human life? What have these human beings done to me? I just can't say. And then he's talking to his Bhabi Jan, his sister-in-law, and he says, where is this rage coming to me from? And I thought it was a very human, very touching inside view of a man, boy's head, a young man's head. Why is he here? Why is he fighting this war? Why is, where is this bloodlust coming from? Okay, now, uh, I may not have time to go into my other choices, but let me very briefly read out uh, something from uh, Amarjeet Chandan work that I referred to earlier, the Punjabi folk songs. I'll read them in uh, English translation because my Punjabi is not very good. So some go like this, don't go, don't go, stay back, my friend. 
Crazy people are packing up, flowers are withering, and friendships are breaking. Stay back, stay back, my friend. Allah gives bread and work. You wouldn't find soothing shades anywhere else. Don't go, my friend, don't go. Remember that while, as I mentioned, there have been three instances of uh, military recruitments in the Punjab, uh, where men have gone as soldiers. This is the first instance where men are being recruited uh, and there is knowledge and awareness that they are going as mercenaries because there are all kinds of inducements. Uh, land in a place like Punjab, it is very valuable. So there is the allurement of land being given, promotions, uh, pension on retirement, a whole bunch of a package, as it were, is being held out for these enlistments. So the, this set of enlistments are very different from the enlistments we have seen in the past in Punjab. And that awareness is there, especially in the folk songs being composed in a woman's voice, sometimes by women themselves, sometimes in a fake female voice. Also, I was struck by the fact that uh, in France, the war is called La Am. Yeah? And in Punjabi, it is being used as Lam. So uh, there are any instances of folk songs, of folk ditties, of songs composed where the word for jung is not being used. The word is Lam, L A M. So the Lam of the, Fra of the French original has become Lam. So, uh, for instance, listen to this My husband and his two brothers all have gone to Lam. Hearing the news of the war, leaves of trees got burnt. War destroys towns and ports, it destroys huts. I shed tears, come and speak to me. And it's in a woman's voice, and the many, many such instances. Another one, mother's sons have gone to the Lam in the foreign lands. May Allah end the Lam, my children, May the five souls of the Prophet's family guard you. May Allah bring you back home safe. And these are in Punjabi. In Punjabi, I also want to give you examples from something called Jangnama. These have been written over the centuries. Uh, Jangnama refers to poems about war. So drawing upon an existing tradition of war poetry in Punjabi, there were specific instances of poems called Jangnama written specifically for the First World War. Again, I'll give you some brief examples translated by um, Raman Singh Chinna uh, from the Punjabi into English. The wrath of destiny has fallen upon mankind since ages. Overthrowing civilizations Hindustan has often seen the rages. Shams Tabrez and Mansoor have seen its spleen on Ana al Haq, the call for truth. Look how it endured upon Hassan and Hussein, on Ali Wali's wealth it has fallen. Remember, these poems are not necessarily written by Muslims. They are mostly written in Punjabi, but instances such as these also give a clue to the syncretism that was so native to Punjab. So you may have Hindu or Sikh poets making references to Ali and to Hussein and so on. And then they also go on to talk about Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the great deities, on Krishna's being, it has fallen, meaning all of these people have faced war, right? So Krishna has exhorted Arjun to wage war. Rama has waged the good fight. So there are instances of war and drawing on all those instances, we have the Jangnama poetry. Now, uh, how am I doing for time? Five more minutes only. So let me do, what I'll do is just give you a sampling of the poetry I have here. There is Sarojini Naidu's beautiful poem called The Gifts of India. It talks, and, but it also takes a very elitist Indian's uh, point of view. It talks of the Indians occupying the high moral ground and saying, we have given you these gifts. Remember, the gifts are not just of men. The gifts are of money and material. I mean, mica, manganese, jute, cotton, tobacco, so many things, animals, 
uh, 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 horses, camels, mules. So I can go on listing the kind of material that has also gone from India and not just men. So Sarojini Naidu is talking uh, in a very genteel way of the gifts of India. And she's saying, let us not forget the most precious gift India has given, which is her sons. But you have other points of view, not so genteel, more sharp, more political. Uh, I'm going to read something in uh, Urdu, Hindi, Hindustani, which is not very difficult, but it will give you a flavor of the times. This is Akbar el Abadi, the very satirical poet, who is, uh, always has his finger to the pulse. And you'll be surprised to see that he is picking up exactly what Tagore is writing in a more sophisticated fashion. Cheeze wo hai jo bane Europe mein. Baat wo hai jo pioneer mein chape. Europe mein hai jo jang ki quwwat badi hui. Lekin fuzu hai uski tijarat badi hui. Mumkin nahi laga sake wo top har jaga. Dekho magar peers ka hai soap har jaga. Real goods... Uh, do you really need a translation? Did you catch most of it? Yeah, you caught most of it. So there's no need to put a cannon everywhere when the soap made by peers is being sold everywhere. Right, uh, let's see uh, Josh Malhiabadi. Shikaste zinda ka khwab, the dream of a defeated prison. Now, uh, he's called the poet of revolution and he's talking about how a revolution is nigh. It's just waiting there. It takes three decades for India to gain independence. But in the warriors, 1914 to 1918, the Indian poet is dreaming of revolution. Kya Hind ka zinda kaap raha hai, goonj rahi hai takbeerein, uktaayin hai shayad kuch qaydi aur tod rahe hai zanjeerein. The prisoners are growing weary of their chains and they are going to break their uh, grown weary of their prisons and they are going to break their chains. A satirical poem by Ahmak Papundvi. Now, many poets such as Ahmak Papundvi, not his real name, uh, were very popular in their age. They were the, 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 the what shall I say, they had the, they knew what was happening in their times and they were picking up on very in, immediate contemporary things. So you have something called the cleverness of the English mind. Angrezi zehen ki tezi. And it seems like it is an ode to the cleverness of the English mind, but it's actually a tongue-in-cheek statement. Ed Dyer, he's talking about Dyer and Dwyer, and often the Urdu poet is using both Dyer and Dwyer. So, but he's talking about that cleverness behind this diabolical English mind. Uh, they are also talking about the Shuddhi movements that are raging in the Punjab at about the same time, and the, tab uh, uh, the Tablighi movement, the Jamaat-e-Islami. So they are bringing together diverse strands in the political arena and making sharp observations. And they are also cautioning the Indian people. If you still don't understand, you will be erased, O oh people of Hindustan, even your tales will be removed from the annals of history. So constantly during these four years of the war, the poetry that I find, the poet is constantly cautioning uh, the Indian people that, you know, take heed, take heed, look at the consequences of this war. Also, um, a poet like Zafar Ali Khan, uh, who's talking about the bugle of freedom. Remember, the bugle of freedom has sounded, but it will take three decades and more for India to attain freedom. He's talking of the crumbs from the rich man's table, from the Angres, the tables, uh, the, the crumbs that have fallen from the English table in the form of the, the uh, Montagu reforms. The reforms that the British government are saying are going to give you more instances of self-rule, but the poet is cautioning you that these are crumbs from the British table. And he says, O oh, toadies, go crawling on your bellies to pick them up. Now, toady is a word that the Indians are using for those Indians, fellow Indians, who are, as it were, furthering the British cause in India. 
Uh, I really think I have run out of time, so what I will do is I will end with uh, a poem called Shukriya Europe. This is by Agha Hashar Kashmiri, a very popular playwright of his time, very popular in Bombay, incidentally. He's written many, many plays for Parsi theater, but that deserves to be studied. Maybe somebody at Sarmaya can have a talk on the, on the Parsi theater and the kind of plays that were being written by people like Agha Hashar Kashmiri. But that's a different thing. Here he's talking of E Zameen e Europe, E Mukraz e Perahan Nawaz, E Harif e Asia, E Shola e German Nawaz. And he's saying, he's talking about, O oh, rival of Asia, O oh, lover of the spark in the harvest, your idea of healing is throwing out everything. Again, he's cautioning the Indian. Uh, he's cautioning. The, the Indian people of the cost of this help. To what extent we are mindful of that cost, I think for that you need to read uh, testimonies from that time. I will end here and I look forward to the testimony that you then we are going to read. Thank you very much. <laughs>